Oh yeah, sexy biscuits. Nice. Long black clothes, 1975 and welcome to the weekly vlog or a weekly vlog of sorts but more specifically a top 10 video it's been a while since I've done a top 10 video uh, no particular reason then I just I don't know I kind of go in phases with the content I make on my channel and a few people behind the scenes have asked me um, if I was going to do any more top 10s about you know various things such as you know like I've touched one before which is game lists uh, console lists things like that uh, because they really really enjoy them and I I like to, you know, I love input from the, you know, the community or the people that watch me. So I do like to, you know, pay that back. So um, there is one that I would really, really like to make. And the reason being, and it's kind of funny because it coincided with this request, you know, would, would you think about doing some more top 10 videos? We really, really like them. Um, is because for the series of God, there's a new playlist you may or may not have seen it, dependent upon why you tune into this channel. Uh, it's basically, uh, I, I take what is considered the best, or to me, the best home port of a well-known, most of the time, uh, at least to me, well-known, most of the time, arcade machine, and compare them because of, you know, that, that phrase we chucked around back in the days that, you know, which everyone I know of my age group or older <clears throat> knows the phrase arcade perfect. We were sucker punched by magazines. Magazines would chuck that phrase around all the time and we 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 ate it up we ate it up in playground wars at school when we argued with people you know like the the um the, the snares versus the mega drive kids and in my case the mega drive versus the amiga kids you know various examples will be thrown at each other and specifically so stuff like you know golden axe and strider on the mega drive where car magazines the the most guilty parties here were the uh, Me Machines magazine, uh, the official guide to consoles, which was, you know, a CVG magazine, and CVG themselves, when Me Machines started off as a couple of pages uh, spread in the middle of that magazine. And they would chuck it around. And if they chucked it around, then we would say, you know, well, that would become, would that phrase or that, you know, for that game would become law for us, would become written law, and we would chuck it around as well in the boasting and the bragging, you know, uh, rights and states, or stakes, I should say, in the playground. More often than not, we knew it wasn't. So I don't know, it's a kid thing, isn't it? But I'm not saying these games are crap. You know, I go, go and check out this series. It will make sense more if you watch some of the videos in this series, because again, off topic about what this video is about. But the point being, we would chuck that around a lot. And so I've been playing a lot of arcade ports, a lot of arcade ports, but more specifically in what's inspired this video and got me thinking about wanting to make this video is playing the arcade original or the arcade parents. And in particular, time and time again, one company uh, would consistently come up and that company would be Sega. Now, if you're looking at the list and saying it's not come up that many times, you haven't seen the full unlisted list, but the point being, um, Sega. Sega were an absolute massive part of my childhood growing up, uh, as they were a massive part of many, many people's childhoods, more so people my age and above, you know, in that specific generation. But th there's no denying that Sega were the arcades. Sega owned the arcades. Now, I mean, I enjoyed other arcade companies. You know, I loved Data East. Uh, I, I love, you know, loved Capcom. Absolutely adored Tato, adored Konami. But time and time again, when I was a kid, particularly in the 80s, and that decade will be important, but we'll get to that in a moment, it was Sega. It was Sega I went to the arcades for. Anything else that was there and good was just a happy byproduct because the arcades to me was Sega. I absolutely loved and adored it. And I was very, very lucky growing up. I've talked about it before, but hell, I'm going to talk about it again. That the first place we went on holiday as kids, which is a caravan site in Blue Anchor Bay. If you want to know more detail about that, check out in my Nostalgic Memories of videos uh, where I talk about holidaying in a caravan. It's brilliant brilliant it's a lot better than it sounds um but there was this uh well there were there were arcades all along the seafront outside of the caravan site we, you know, there were great arcades and had you know the first memories of star wars uh atari star wars arcade and stuff like that 
and uh, first memories of uh, Karate Champ and um, Kung Fu Master. But there was this absolutely fantastic arcade in Minehead. Um, and we would always, whenever we went to the town, Minehead was a town just over from it. Whenever we went to that town, we would always make a beeline to this arcade. My parents were really, really good. Uh, you know, they were kind of hang around, hang around in there, you know, bored, <laughs> wondering why the place smelled like piss, cigarettes and alcohol and shame. Um, and a pinch of addiction, but obviously to make sure we were okay. But this arcade was renowned. Certain arcades of my childhood were renowned for having, or if it was gonna, you know, come out and you, it was gonna be a popular big title that you saw in other places or people mentioned about, or even only magazines. You knew this arcade would get it. You know, the, they had Return of the Jedi, they had Paperboy, they had Arkanoid. You know, they had a hexagonal pool table. Which to this day, I would love to own. They had absolutely everything. They had Indiana Jones. They had Gauntlets. It was phenomenal. The other arcade, once we stopped going on holiday here, was in a place called Westwood Ho, which again had a whole bunch of arcades. And some of the games I will mention in this list, um, they they were in the other arcades here. But this main arcade that was bolted onto the side of a fish and chip shop, uh, used to go and get fish and chips on a Friday night when we went to Westwood Ho to stay in our chalet. And then I, once I got the chips, well, when they were waiting, I'd go down the steps into this arcade, play Double Dragon, and it always reminds me of the smell of fish and chips uh, to this day. And this arcade was fantastic. I don't really want to mention the Sega arcade machines because I'll leave a little bit of story for the video, but it, th this had everything. Th this was just, it had Guerrilla Wars, it had that New Zealand story, you know, we had Chase HQ, uh, you name it, it had it, had the Kanami Wrestling games. It was just, it was just, it was fantastic. This is easily the best arcade of my entire life. Seriously. Uh, and then just down the road from us, Seaso Seaside Town, you know, in the West Country, um, Western Supermare still got a few good arcades, not many, and it's got a pier, which is pretty good for arcades. But back then, there were loads of arcades. There were absolutely loads of arcades, and there, some of my experiences of the Sega machines came from there. But I remember playing Ghosts and Goblins and stuff there. But I had a very, very lucky childhood when it came to being exposed to arcades, and you know, um, lucky enough to have great parents who would, you know, give us, you know, pounds into ten p's and stuff like that, so we can have these experiences in arcades. But the point being, of all these arcades, the ones that I loved the most was Sega. Sega were the arcades of my childhood. And that's why I'm doing this. I'll get to saying it eventually. My top 10 favorite Sega arcade machines of all time. I'm saying of all time, but it's weird because of all time, I mean the 80s. Uh, it's not because I dislike, uh, I'm not pinning it down to the 80s. It just happens to be all of these are from the 80s, uh, pretty much. Um, but that that was it. That was because I was of that young age and stuff. Th this was just like the most mind blowing and, uh, you know, eye opening period of my sorry hiccups. <clears throat> That's a new one. Not Windy Pops hiccups of my, you know, sort of gaming growing up experience. So I was five at the start of the 80s and 15 um, at the end of them. And, and just this this is why all these games happen to fall into the 80s. I mean, the 90s was fantastic. Sega were pioneers and, the, you know, technical achievements in the early 90s, you know, like the Virtua series and stuff like that. Obviously, um, Daytona Arcade and Sega Rally, I absolutely love those machines. And, you know, they, they but they weren't staple arcade machines that I would make a beeline to. I would play hours and hours and hours. I don't know what it was. It was just the 80s games and maybe it was that sort of period of ZX Spectrum and stuff like that, you know, and it being the, the ultimate version of the game that you always wanted a home port of, but this was the ultimate version and stuff like that. I just, it's the 80s. So my top 10 favorite arcades, Sega arcade games are from the 80s, not the 90s. Nothing wrong with the 90s, um, but I'm saying of all time because they simply happen to fall into this bracket so basically that was a really long introduction i apologize by, about that but let's get into my top 10 favorite sega arcade machines of all time so we're going to start off with alien storm now this list is in no particular order and yes i said the 80s but and this is 1990 so you know what sue me it's 1990 it's the 80s but basically and um this is one game i never got to see in those beloved arcades i always talk about i actually played this in the services on the motorway for the first time obviously on the way to uh i think it was westwood home the second holiday home we had which i thought was weird because i really really wanted to play it and i really thought it would show up in you know my beloved arcade but yeah it's a sequel to alien syndrome and i was super hyped for it 
simply because I knew what it was, which was, it was Golden Axe with sci-fi and stuff, basically. Three separate characters, two players simultaneous, so I would play it with my brothers when we kind of stopped the travel sickness and having to take a piss. And one's a bloke, one's a bird, and one's a robot. And yeah, you protect the Earth from aliens. Golden Axe style, only with bonus stages where it's first person shooter, so that blew me away. And also, as did the graphics. I mean, I love Golden Axe, <clears throat> and Golden Axe is higher, uh, or I like it more than this game, but there's no denying, especially being a massive Aliens fan, which was in a great arcade machine by Konami, that this whole sci fi setting I thought was brilliant, especially since, <clears throat> excuse me, Alien Busting will do that. You know, some of the Aliens were just clearly inspired by Aliens alien and you know it's supposed to be kind of gross out and stuff like this and then he chucked in these you know side scrolling first person shooter stages which was something else i'd never really seen of or expected when um you know i knew that golden axe was getting basically could you argue a somewhat pseudo sequel albeit sci-fi but the graphics blew me away better than golden axe i would say you know the fact that it was sci-fi in weapons, the music is amazing. It's got good sense of humor and stuff like that. Absolutely love this game. Definitely what, you know, the, the sort of two-player simultaneous greatness and stuff that Sega were amazing at. Great graphics, great sound, great presentation, great variety. Great. So, obviously, this had to be in here. This is Thunderblade, at least in... 1988 and you'll be surprised to know or might be surprised to know that this edged out afterburner in sort of you know the sprite scaling games i wanted in this list or are in this list because they were my favorite games um mainly because of all sega sprite scaling games even ones i prefer over this aren't as impressive as the pseudo 3d in this because you have two ways it represents the environment one like this which no other company I could think of at the time attempted to do where stacking on sprites upon each other like this and moving up and down into the environment created this proper for the time nothing else looked as good as this and it's you know one of the reasons this made my list um, and I loved it back then but yeah nothing looked as good as this and it looked like proper 3D and then you go into this environment did I mention that you're basically blue thunder as well I mean look at this and you can appreciate it more because it's more solid 3D and I guess because it's slightly slower, which is why I prefer it to Afterburner, and doesn't piss along it, you do, tru do truly get the time to see these visuals. And this, there was nothing like this. This is probably the most graphically impressive arcade machine at the time. And to be fair, one of Sega's most graphically impressive sprite scalers. I mean, I love Space Harrier, Afterburner, Outrun, Enduro Racer, Outrunners, Power Drift, the list goes on and on. But this dwarfs all of them when it comes to graphics. I mean, you know, games are about more than graphics, but hey, throw me a bone. I was like, what, in 1988? 11 or something? 12? Uh, so, yeah, this, 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 this hooked me in, and I, it was an arcade in Westwood Home, where it had not a pneumatic cabinet, but a mechanical cabinet with gears and stuff, and you sat in like a little helicopter chair with the, the monitor, and th again, this is why it's in there, not, not ignoring the fact that it's graphically amazing, but, you know, looks fantastic, plays fantastic, sounds fantastic, it just, it is 80s Saturday afternoon TV, this sucked up so much money of my life. But yeah, this is just about as perfect as games got back then, and definitely a high point for Sega, even by their standards. But yeah, th this cabinet that was, you know, wasn't pneumatic or whatever, or hydraulic, I should say, it was gears and shit, and so you would move the joystick one way and the chair would go the opposite way to replicate, I guess, how it feels to control a helicopter, but Thunderblade, you know, this is, this is not my favorite sprite scaler, but it is easily the most impressive looking sprite scaler, and compared to all other sort of games of the time, with its top-down 3D sprite stacking, just a whole other sort of dimension in visuals and graphics. So obviously Shinobi made it into this list. Is anyone ever gonna be in doubt that it would? I loved it, you know, it was ninjas. Ninjas were big, you know, and cool and movies and stuff back in the day as a kid. And you have this two-tier system that Sega would become very well known for. I mean, other companies did it, but Sega did it more than others. You know, an upper deck, a lower deck. You had a sprite that looked great. You had music that was amazing. Did I mention that you had ninjas? Um, the, the arcade I always talk about Westwood Hope, which will be, you know, prevalent in this, this video, uh, they had two copies. They had a hooky, a legal one, um, 
that was made by a different company, only it wasn't. It was just a, you know, a pirate machine. And then they had the official one. And I always wanted to play on the official one, not just because it had a proper coloured screen, but it was just a variety in weapons. You know, you had shuriken, you had rocket, you know, um, gun. You got in close, you could kick them or use your uh, your katana. Is it a katana if you're a ninja? You know, the blokes, the, the rescuing the kids. It was just... Oh, this was a staple of my childhood. Everyone I knew loved this. My older brother loved this more than me, and that's saying a lot because this is one of my, well, favourite Sega arcade machines of all time, hence the video you're watching. But yeah, to me this still looks great. And no home version. There are some pretty good ones, some close ones, but, you know, no home version completely nailed it. The PC Engine was close, but yeah. I love it. The variety in bosses, the variety in stages, absolutely balls hard and challenging. That bit's wasted on me as a kid because I wasn't the greatest, you know, games player, but not now, obviously. But yeah, it just, I don't know, I've got such nostalgia for it. And no other companies, I mean, they all had side scrollers or side scrolling beaters and stuff, but not necessarily did the two stage stuff as well, even though some did. No other company just had a game out at the time. Then this is 1987, I believe. It quite did everything or ticked all the boxes that Shinobi did. Quite frankly, deservedly, you know, one of my favorite Sega arcade machines of. Gotcha, you bastard, all time. And these blokes, tricky little bastards. Here's one that might surprise you. Enduro Racer 1986, Sega. 86 for Sega was such, change gear, uh, an amazing year. And another sprite scale. And once again, this was a year or so. Out, out, out. <laughs> Ooh after um, Space Harrier, and it was leaps and bounds ahead. And also, the reason I like this, because you might be you know, thinking, well, there's loads of sprite scalers on this list, Dave, depending on the order I put them on. And yeah, maybe there are, but stuff like Hang On, I mean, I loved OutRun, I really did. But Hang On to me was, I didn't need it because I had OutRun, and that's the sort of racing game I wanted to play. Uh, when it came to a bike, seeing this, again in Westwood Ho, oh my god, if I could recreate that. Fucking arcade. Um, I should have a pilgrimage to its site and lay a wreath of flowers. But yeah, when I first saw this, it was it wasn't a full sit-down cabinet as such. Um, well, you kind of sound it. It had handlebars, it had a proper dirt bike handlebars, and you would pull them forwards to execute the jump. I just massively failed to do, which would give you higher, you know, um, distance through the air to get around all the obstacles as I'm doing appalling the app. But yeah, you know, the the, the sweeps, the dirts, the undulation. This is, change sign, there we go, this is just amazing. And as I said, the, the fact that it was a dirt bike, and dirt biking, thanks to, you know, TV shows like um, Kickstart. Who remembers Kickstart on BBC Two on a Sunday? I was going to sing the music then, but now. Nah. But yeah, thanks to shows like that, dirt biking was cool, you know, like, proper, proper motor biking. No one really cared about that when I was a kid. So to see this, again, in this now becoming massively recognisable style of sprite skating that Sega was doing was just something else. And the, the, the pull down handlebars, yeah, I mean, I was all over it. And another game that my parents must have just looked at me and just went, dear God, all our hard, again, you have the standard map with all these price skaters, all our hard-earned wages are flying into that machine because of our boy. But yeah, Enduro Racer, you know, like I said, to me, Outrun covered Hang On type types of games. This was fun because it was something else. It was biking done differently. Racing done differently. Is anyone ever really in doubt that Altered Beast would be in here as well? This game is a staple of my childhood and absolutely iconic. I mean, I was raised on, you know, Sinbad uh, and Clash of the Titans and stuff like that, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, patient for the pooch to wait. So uh, th this was all like my bread and butter and stuff. And obviously, you know, the, the effect of Ray Harryhausen. So the whole kind of, you know, Greek mythology and stuff like that was absolutely not wasted on me. And the fact that, you know, you kind of went Arnold Schwarzenegger up, you know, like Conan and stuff, in the sense that you got all beefy and graphics were great. I mean, you, we... It's many of these games back then. I mean, they are my favourite games, Sega, Sega games of all time. But they were just made to make a massive amount of money. But the thing is, you don't see that shit as a kid, do you? And this was just funny thing is, uh, yeah, this was just amazing. But I never got to play it in my beloved arcades of Westwood Ho and um, Blue Anchor and Minehead because I well they didn't have it. And I remember seeing it in magazines and wanting to play it so badly, uh, the arcade version that is. And basically. It showed up when we were on a school trip when I was a kid, because this is 1988, and this was a school trip when I was a kid, I believe in 1989, when we went to a place called Simmons Bath. 
and it was just for a weekend, um, kind of a reward, you know, when you were in, what, the third year or something, because we went there in the first year, and um, I had an operation and just come out of hospital, so I wasn't allowed to take part, uh, you know, in this thing where they went swimming, so I was given a stack of 10 peas and had to wait upstairs in the cafeteria where everyone else got to go in the swimming pool, you know, like floats and stuff like that, I don't care, I think I got the better deal, and um, they had a couple of arcade machines, and this was one of them, and, it was the, and I was just like, holy shit, they got Altered Beast, and that was my first experience of it, and I thought I got the better end of the stick than having to go swimming in a chlorine stinking pool that probably a lot of people had pissed in because it was the 80s, but yeah, I was chuffed to bits that I got to play this, I wasn't particularly good, I couldn't get past the second stage, but I did get to power up a couple of times, and the whole thing was just... I'm turning into beasts, I'm turning into monsters, it's set in Greece, I'm a fucking centurion. Just, oh, good time, stick a fork in me, I'm done. Ultra Beast, deservedly in my top 10 favourite Sega Arcade machines of all time. Again, absolute no-brainer that Golden Axe was going to be in there. Much like I mentioned in Altered Beast, that being a massive fan of certain types of movies and Ray Harryhausen and shit like that, because of the skeletons in this, basically, that were stolen from Jason and the Golden Fleece, the, the, you know, the subject matter of this game, and again, Conan, was was right up my uh, my alley, and this was in my beloved arcade in Westwood Ho, and just, oh, it's just good times, absolutely love this game. It's funny, I remember uh, being, um, you know, actually driving down to Westwood Ho with my dad, uh, we were there to do a job or something. I can't remember what it was uh, on the uh, on the chalet. And just knowing that this this arcade was so good at it, you know having all the latest titles, and had never played this, and was reading a magazine um, with uh, you know announcing that it was uh, coming out on the Mega Drive or something like that. And and just remember knowing like oh they've got to have it, they've got to have it. Oh please have it. Will you have it? And they did. And that was the first time I ever got to play it. And yeah, you know three players simultaneous. Two players simultaneous, three characters to choose from. Everyone thought to be the uh, the dwarf, but you know, just this whole magic like that, sexy, you know, um, mythology using animals or monsters as you know, basically vehicular combat. Big sprites, you know, uh, big bosses. Short game, but you know, like, and the stuff like you know, one of the you know, the levels on the back of a bloody flying bird. One of the villages on a turtle. I mean. Does Terry Pratchett know he did, he did that? Come on, it was taken from that. But yeah, this is just, this is still a great, absolutely fantastic game, you know? And as I, it's not really that series of videos, but obviously uh, everyone goes on about the uh, home version of Mega Drive being arcade perfect. It's not. You've got, you've got to go back to the arcade to know what greatness is. That's not to say the Mega Drive one's bad, but yeah, look at it. This is, this is, Sega could do no bloody wrong, hence the fact that this is in here. They're side-scrolling fighters, they're two-tier systems, you know, they're driving games. Seriously, they should have been knighted in the 80s. Choppy chop chop. And like I said, you know, obviously, Alien Storm was basically an update of this. More confined uh, gameplay, as you could say. But yeah, an update of this, but with bloody space and guns and sci-fi and crap. Oh. Good times. And here we go, here's another sprite scale. I mean, come on, it was a given that 50% of my list was probably gonna be sprite scalers, but Galaxy Force 2, I played this in the Trocadero Center in London. Do you remember the Trocadero Center? When you could go there to play certain arcade machines, they had the Aliens physical ride experience there, and the Nickelodeon studio that you thought was really big until you could walk by it on the outside, and it was just a one room with cameras filming two people in it. Weird, but they had this. This was not a common machine. Um, back in the day because and it was of oh, 1988 and it's another reason that Afterburner didn't make this list because planes uh, stick me in a spaceship that's kind of like Afterburner but more like Space Harrier you know in sci-fi and stuff with amazing visuals because the visuals are something you know a step above Afterburner and this look at that this is just brilliant and you can select your destination you fight inside um, planets and outside planets you fight in space it, it is sprite scaling to the absolute best another perfect example of a game that just could not be ported to home systems back in the day i find it funny that lots of the best ports of these are ones like uh, on the 3ds like this power drift you know and all the sprite scalers but this blew me away when i saw it in the trocadero, trocadero center i would never seen graphics like this i mean i'd seen outrun I'd seen a Dura Racer, stuff like that, and I thought I'd seen the pinnacle. I mean, look at that rock formation there of oh, sprite scaling. But Sega just kept dropping stuff out like this, and it just 
gloomy. Look at that! Yoink! Shit, that's because I can't fly. But obviously lasers and guns. It's just graphically absolutely phenomenal. Nothing else could touch it. You're in a spaceship. You can fly inside Death Stars, basically. And shoot all kinds of tech and shit. And flames come out the floor. This was something else. That's why this made it for my list of sprite scalers. Uh, I don't know how well it's emulating. Um, but yeah, had to go all the way to London. I didn't go all the way to London just to play this as a kid. My family went up there for a day trip. We went up on the National Express, you know, like a tenner return trip and um, yeah t t mainly one of the reasons we wanted to go was to go to the Trocadero Centre because there were programs on TV saying look at these cabinets because the cabinet for this was quite big and it actually had like little rope cords around it you know like those rope separators you get in cinemas to keep people in line there you go look at this penetrate the fortress without buying it dinner first it were but yeah it, you know it was known for these bigger arcade machines they even had which didn't make this list for obvious reasons shit um a G-Lock where you actually rotate to the full 360 degrees, but that's a story for another time. But yeah, Galaxy Force 2, you know, I'm not a sprite skater that had to make the list at the cost of others. I'm wondering how many of you correctly guessed that Michael Jackson's Moonwalker would be in this list. Obviously, it was released in 1990, so it's not really the 80s, but it's the end of the 80s, if you know what I mean. And I played this in a different arcade in Westwood Ho and found it by sheer accident because we used to go to this other arcade because they had a claw machine and turtles were huge at this point, albeit Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. And basically, they had uh, all these plushy turtles in them. We tried really, really hard to win them. Didn't realize until later on that the claw was rigged. But then we heard this booming music in the background, you know, Michael Jackson music. And you got to remember, we take CD sound for granted now on consoles and stuff like that, CD quality sound. But this, coming out of an arcade machine, was just unbelievable. Look, you got a helper monkey. Bubbles helped you, so he's a helper monkey. And you're a friggin' robot. But listen to the music. This was just unbelievable when we found it, because I don't care what anyone says, we all love Michael Jackson back then. Hell, I still do. And yeah, it, it blew us away. It was graphically stunning for the time it came out. You know, there wasn't another beat-em-up like it. Obviously, you're Michael Jackson. You could be three-player. At the same time, you turn into a robot, you can press a button, which I failed to do there, where everyone, you would dance them to death on the screen. There was no whole, oh, that's so cool. you got to remember, this just blew me away as a kid, and it plays amazingly. But, yeah, uh, there was no home port of this one. I like the home ports that there were, you know, with the home games, but there you go, watch. Again, this was absolutely unheard of. Yeah, it, this, this was just something else. This was... It's weird. It was an experience, but not at the expense of gameplay, if that makes sense. Because it's style. Look at the style of it. It's the only way you could do Michael Jackson justice. Even before basing it on his movie Moonwalker. So yeah, I'm, I'm waffling, but sound, presentation, graphics, the actual solid gameplay. This was something else at the time, you know. This was just Sega showing their, you know, mastery of how to do something, well, a character justice and do something proper. Obviously it was a no-brainer that OutRun was going to make it on here. Released in 1986 by Sega, a year after Space Harrier, and the graphical improvements are unbelievable. The way the road moves, the undulation, the, the memorable, beyond memorable music that's now famous uh, that you could select on the title screen by turning a key. Ooh, it's frisky, mind. But yeah, Fry Testarossa, you and your bird racing across America with multiple branching routes. Again, that was something that was unheard of. Uh, I saw this in the sit-down cabinet in Westwood Ho. It was 50p a pop, and I lost so much of my life to this game. Nothing looked like it. No other driving game would look like this or compete with this for absolute years. Look at that, health and safety. Ooh, Beetle, health and safety with the lake on the side. But yeah, the way, you know, the scenery changes. Ooh, balls! You know, uh, at night, today, things like that. It was so far ahead of its time. And I can't talk and play this at the same time, but yeah. I mean, it's self-aware as well. There's an, oh shit, there's an arcade cabinet of Outrun in one of the backgrounds. Got a high and low gear. Uh, did they license the Fry for Testarossa? Uh, for, you know, the Testarossa from Ferrari, I should say, but yeah, to me this still looks amazing, and this blue, I mean, I was 11, 10, this blue, balls, look at that, it called Dave absolutely sideways, I'm pretty sure this must be a, mo there you go, the phenomenal map, 
and the number of multiple routes. This must be on most people's favourite Sega arcade machines of all time. Another example of being so advanced, and as I said, such a leap over Space Harrier that, you know, um, it could not be ported to a home system properly, like properly, not, you know, cross your eyes and fudge it and hope it, you know, it kind of resembles it. Yeah, nothing had the grunt to do this for years. Look, she's getting pissed off at me. It's little touches like that as well. You've got your map in your bottom right and going to stay on this side of the road. Yeah, I cannot, I cannot explain what seeing this for for the first time in my life and also and in the arcade once I you know dumped a certain amount of money into it I got all right at it you know I could get like five stages in which when you're 11 is pretty good I'm breaking because I thought there's something coming up from me but it was just the horizon yep knows me oop, oop. and yeah like I said no other driving games could touch this graphically for years oh they try and people say like Chase HQ could no, it couldn't. Absolutely no, it could not. This was just amazing sounding, amazing to play, and amazing to look at. Outrun, quite possibly one of the greatest arcade games of all time, and deservedly on my favourite Sega arcade machine games of all time list. There's the cabinet, see? While this list has been in no particular order, this game was left to the end because this game is my favourite Sega arcade machine of all time. Is it as particularly deep as some of the other entries? Probably not. You know, is it advanced as some of the other sprite scalers I've mentioned in this list? Absolutely not. And obviously nostalgia does play a big part in things. But I cannot explain to you the impact this game had, and not just on myself, but on so many people of my generation, the first time we saw it, particularly if you were lucky enough to see the full sit-down cabinet with the, you know, hydraulic chair, which I did. And this wasn't in those uh, other two amazing arcades I so often talk of. This was down the road in Western Supernet, Supermare. One year for a birthday, my mum took me and my twin brother, not obviously my older brother, can't ignore him just because it's not his birthday, eh? to Western Supermare for a day out to get fish and chips and stuff. And I saw this in the arcade. And you gotta remember, for 1985, I'm 10. I've been around arcades for a while at this point. I mean, look at this, this still, maybe it's because I'm old. This still, to me, looks absolutely amazing. The music is phenomenal, especially coming out of those arcade machine speakers. But yeah, I've been around arcade machines at this point, and I've seen a great many arcade machines. But this, this sprite scaling, you know, technology, which I guess you could argue Sega kind of introduced on um, Buck Rogers' Planet of Zoom. This nothing looked like this. I mean, is that reason enough for it being my favourite game of all time? Sega arcade game? Uh, yes. Because, like I said, you kids today cannot imagine. This would have been like, you know, having, having a Super Nintendo and then the next console that was released two years later was an Xbox 360. This was just mind-numbingly, glowingly fantastic a leap above everything else we'd ever seen and obviously kicked off Sega's massive domination of the arcades particularly with sprite scaling I mean and it's still really hard to talk and play at the same time and there never really was a truly perfect arcade port of this to the home systems to many 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 iterations of hardware generations later so yeah you know no particular order or not but I can say this is easily my favorite Sega arcade machine of all time now Let's round up. And there, there you have it. Uh, obviously, I've touched upon some of these before. I've done gameplays of some of these before. There will always be crossover in my videos because of the massive amount of nostalgia and love I have for these games and had for these games back in the day and the impact they had on my childhood and my, my gaming, you know, life experiences. But hey, I, I had to do this list. It was really, really, really important for me to do this list. And like I said, uh, you know, they are all from the 80s. There's nothing wrong with the 90s. This was just my period, my favorite period of arcade games ever, not just for Sega, across all companies, but Sega just happened to be, as I said at the start of this video, uh, the arcade experience for me. They were the kings of arcades, you know. Before they were the kings of consoles, they were the kings, king of consoles for a bit, I should say. But they were the kings of arcades, and they, to me, will always be my childhood arcade experience. Sega. As always, I'd love to know what you think. What are your 10 favourite Sega arcade machines of all time? And that's any, any decade. How, if, if you know, what are your favourite 10 arcade machines of all time by other companies? And as always, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you later.